Alrighty, so what we've got here is we've got an unknown diprotic acid, H2A, and I've got 0.6 grams of it here, uh, all set and ready to go. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, taking that uh, diprotic acid and putting it into a titration rig over here where I have a pH probe uh, that is uh, currently sticking into a water solution and a 0.2 molar solution of sodium hydroxide that is set up here so that it is exactly at zero. I'm going to uh, add in the acid uh, solution and uh, the pH of this guy should uh, drop significantly. And as I add this in over here, so again, I'm at a pH uh, right around an eight right now. So again, it might be just a little off of water here. It won't matter. But if I go ahead and add in our weak acid here and uh, let this guy uh, dissolve, uh, we can see that our pH is gonna start to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop as that weak acid uh, dissolves there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, titrate this guy um, and keep track of the pH as I add more and more and more and more of the solution here. And as I do that, I should be able to keep track of what the pH is at various uh, volumes and ultimately come up with a titration curve for this substance that will give me a lot of information about what the molar mass of this is as well as the Ka1 and the Ka2 once I develop the uh, diprotic titration curve. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now and spare you all the boring parts of the experiment. And through the magic of photo editing, we will just jump straight to the results. So here we are with our results. And um, this list of acids here, oxalic, malonic, malic, malic, tartaric, and phthalic, uh, are the uh, six choices that I'm going to give you to try to identify which one of these it is. And we're going to do this primarily in three different ways. We are going to identify what the molar mass of the substance is based upon the formula. Now, again, if I had not given you this, these numbers here, if I had not told you what the molar masses were, those are not difficult to find. All you have to do is add up the masses of the um, formula here. So, for example, uh, if I were to look at uh, oxalic acid, uh, that would then be... This guy here would be uh, 2, and then uh, 2 times 12 is 24, and 4 16s is 64. So 2, 24, and 64 is your 90 uh, that's there, right? So <clears throat> these numbers here are not a big mystery or anything. They are simply the sum of all of the molar masses of all of the atoms within the diprotic acid that's there. So sometimes they'll give you the molar mass, sometimes they won't. This one, we're gonna keep it simple. Uh, and then the other part of it is going to be the Ka1 and the Ka2, which you should be able to get from your titration curve. So having titrated that acid that I showed you there in the setup, uh, we end up with this kind of result. So remember that this was done using 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide on 0.6 grams of our dipro unknown diprotic acid. So there's gonna be two parts uh, to this. Well, really three. Um, but the first part is to determine what the molar mass of this is. So the molecular weight or the molar mass is simply equal to the grams per mole. Now remember, I gave you the grams. So you're halfway there, free for nothing, and you haven't even done anything. So your grams is gonna be 0.60 grams because that's what we measured on the scale. The only question then becomes how many moles are there? And you can determine the moles from the first equivalence point. And it sure looks to me like the first equivalence point is right at about 25 milliliters, and it's 25 milliliters of 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide. So that spot right there is 0 0.025 liters. So again, 0 0.025 liters at 0.2 molarity should get you 0 0.005 moles. So if we're talking 0 0.60 grams divided by 0 0.005 moles, that should give you an overall molecular weight experimentally of about 120 grams per mole. So if we come up here 
there are really only a couple of them that are even in the ballpark of that. Uh, certainly, Malayic looks like our best chance there at 116. But 120, you're probably not talking about anything here or here. I suppose you could squint real hard and say that it's, you know, one of these three that are right here, because those are at least in the ballpark of that within a 10% error kind of a thing. So then how are you going to get the uh, final determination? Well, you're going to get them via KA1 and KA2 here. So how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to do that through the midpoints of the two titrations. So the midpoints are each going to occur halfway to the each of the equivalence point or halfway between the two equivalence points. So our first midpoint is going to be between 0 and 25 here. So that's this guy here at 12 and a half. And so if we look real close at this guy and simply come over, the whole idea of the midpoint is that the pH here equals the pKa. And so that looks to be in the neighborhood of any rate of about, I don't know, 1.9 or so. And so your pKa then is going to be 1.9 or your Ka is going to be in the vicinity of 10 to the negative 1.9. Or if we did the math on that, uh, let's see, 1.9, negative 10 to the, that's going to be in the vicinity of about 1.3 uh, times 10 to the negative 2. That's going to be Ka1. So really what we're looking at here is somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to the negative 2. So does Malaic have 10 to the negative 2 for its Ka1? Sure does. It's got it at 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2, and we had it at one point. 3 times 10 to the negative 2. Hey, it's, it's an experiment, right? So, uh, and then our second Ka value should match up as well. And our second Ka value is uh, going to be right in between the first equivalence point and the second equivalence point. The first one is obviously here at 25. The second one is obviously here at 50. So halfway between those two is our 37 and a half which is right around there or so. And so if we make a spot over there, that then uh, is going to be right around about a 6.1. So that would be your pKa2. And so if you have a pKa2 of 6.1, then that would be 10 to the negative 6.1. Or if we put it in <clears throat> scientific terms, that's going to be around 7.9 times 10 to the negative 7th or so. So we should be looking somewhere in that vicinity. And sure enough, the, that one here is about 8.5 times 10 to the negative seventh. So from all indications uh, of the data that we have here, we are certainly within a pretty, uh, pretty close range of this guy here being a malic acid sample based upon the Ka1, which we are going to get from this midpoint the Ka2, which we are going to get from that midpoint, and then the molar mass, which we are going to get here from the equivalence point and the grams that we got there. So you can actually get a great deal of information from a graph like this if uh, you are so interested and, and, and have all the tools to do so. Now, one of the other things that they might ask you on questions like this is this. They'll say, uh, what kind of indicator should you use for these various points? Well, it all depends on which of the equivalence points you would like to see. If you would like to see the first equivalence point, then you want the indicator to be at this point right here. Somewhere in that blob's vicinity, the closer you can get to a pH of right around 4, the better off you'll be. It doesn't have to be exactly 4. But the closer that you can get to a pH of 4, that's going to be the best choice. So if we're going to come here, then it looks to me like maybe methyl orange is going to be the best one for equivalence point uh, 1 because that's the one that's, the one that's uh, closest to a, a pH of 4. If you want to know about equivalence point number 2 here, then you're going to want something that changes in the vicinity of about 9.5 or so. And so that would be, uh, oh, you could probably get away with phenethylene here at 9.7. So that's a good one here at equivalence point two, if that's what you wanted to 
uh, identify visually rather than using the computer uh, to tell you what the specific pH is. So if you wanted to know what the equivalence points are, uh, this here is your equivalence point two, this here is your equivalence point one, and then you would want uh, indicators that changed at those particular uh, points there. And those would tell you the equivalence points rather than the midpoints, if that's what you were interested in. So lots that you can tell from this, and once you learn how to decipher it, it's really not that tough.